Many of us will probably think we know the story of creation from the Bible's book of Genesis. But what if I told you the details in that creation story that are easily forgotten, yet, if read carefully, will show that the story of creation in the Bible is actually a descendant of the Proto-Indo-European creation myth. A story that itself started over 6,000 years ago in the Russian steppes by the Black Sea, and not in the Near East. A number of the previous videos I've produced on this channel talk about the Proto-Indo-European creation myth, how it evolved, why it evolved, and where it can be found today in its various forms. And today, I'm going to add to this with probably the most surprising revelation about the creation myth, and I'll do this by going through the first chapter of Genesis, plus some of the other texts in the Old Testament of the Bible. And I'll compare them to the Proto-Indo-European myth and descendants of that myth to show that the similarities are more than just coincidental. Now, one of the reasons I'm doing this is that, in my experience, very few biblical scholars understand the Proto-Indo-European myths or their migration, or indeed look outside their own sphere of reference. And very few Indo-European anthropologists really dive into the meaning behind the words of the Bible. And I feel qualified to say this because when I've challenged biblical experts, they come up short when you ask them about evidence about the origins of Genesis. They mention things like Jewish law or remnants of myth within the Bible, but there's very little evidence they actually point to that can reflect what they're saying directly. Now, this doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It just means that people I've spoken to aren't absolutely sure where the information about their understanding is within the Bible. And so in this video, we're going to lift the cover off the surface of Genesis, the Genesis story, and show where those connections are. And to start this journey off, I'll take a look at the Proto-Indo-European creation myth and explain how we know it is what it, we say it is. And then we'll look at Genesis and analyze that and try to understand the origins behind that story and see if there are any remnants of the previous myths that can be found and their meanings. I also have to say that when I first made this journey in my own study some years ago now and discovered what I'm about to tell you, well, what I found amazed me. And so I hope you find this of interest too, which is a great segue into asking you to like this video and subscribe to this channel if you do. Um, it only takes a moment, it costs nothing, cheers me up and allows even more people to see this video. That has to be a good thing. So thank you all for your support, for watching your comments. And so without further delay, welcome to the Proto-Indo-European origins of the biblical creation story. Welcome to Krakenfurt. So let's start over 6,000 years ago, long before any words were written in the Bible. And I'll begin with the Proto-Indo-European creation myth and explain how we know this myth existed. Now, as I mentioned in the introduction, I've made a number of videos on this subject, such as this one. Uh, and if you want to dive into this subject further, um, I will do a, a full in-depth video covering all the parts of the myth soon too, here in one large documentary form. But let me tell you a synopsis of the story behind the myth. Uh, and it begins when academics and researchers started to recognise that a number of the creation myths across the Eurasian continent had similarities, but not just in their plot, but within the types of characters and even specific names of characters within these stories. And when these stories were overlaid with data from phylogenetic research, so understanding the evolution of language and how it changes as it migrates, and with DNA analysis of human migration to understand where people migrated to, it became clear that all these creation stories from around Europe and Asia came from a single source. And that source was a culture that spoke a language called Proto-Indo-European, and that this originated in the areas of the Russian steppes by the Black Sea around 8,000 years ago. Now, it must be noted that Proto-Indo-European is a language, not a culture. However, the language bred 
as did the beliefs of the people who spoke it due to other people wanting to interact with them. They wanted to acquire their technology, such as farming techniques. Uh, they wanted to know how to look after cows, create wheel transport. Um, the people who spoke Proto-Indo-European rode horses. And therefore, the non-Proto-Indo-European speakers also believed the Proto-Indo-European speakers must have had better gods because they had all these wonderful things. And so that would have helped not only spread the language, but spread the beliefs uh, with the technology and the language. Uh, and that made the Proto-Indo-European speaking people the ancestors of much of Europe and uh, the Near East today and places beyond this. Now, knowing this, we can rewind time and the evolution of the stories and then can construct the original creation myth. And we can see that there is an evolutionary path of the myth from the Proto-Indo-European speakers to Genesis. And so this gives us confidence that there will actually be clues in the Bible that will show traces of the source myth. And so for those of you who haven't heard it, I'll give you an overview of the original Proto-Indo-European creation myth now. Uh, and for ease of reference, I'll use Professor David Anthony's thoughts uh, from his book, The Horse, The Will and Language, as a template. So you have a printed version um, to get a reference from. And so we'll act as an independent source. And I place reference to uh, this book in the description below um, if you're interested in, in wanting a copy of that. And so the myth go something like this. In the beginning of the cosmos, two beings were created, Manus and Gemo, meaning man and twin, respectively. And also with them was a giant cow on which they suckled for milk and strength. Manus wanted a home, wanted order, wanted to stop wandering through the cosmos. And so he killed Yemo, and from his body created the sky god, the ocean god and the earth, and finally man. He came down to the earth as a priest figure and he taught man that through ritual sacrifice he would keep the world in order. Now, on the face of this story it may not seem particularly insightful, but because we understand many of the versions that have derived from this, we can understand some of the key pieces of myth within it. As these are pieces we would expect to see uh, in descendant versions of the myth in other cultures later in the historical record. So what are these key points? Well, they are at the start of the myth, there is a primordial being who was a twin figure, as Yemo means twin, uh, and he was an androgyny. So he was neither man nor woman, but both. And the primordial being was sacrificed uh, in this version of the myth by Manus, who represents the first man. And from the body parts of the now dead Yemo, Manus creates the world. Then Manus goes down to the world as a priest figure and then creates humans, teaching them about ritual sacrifice to the gods. And finally, the cow remains as it is a symbol representing the source of food and resources. So you may still be asking, how do we really know this? Well, I've spoken about this in other videos, but in summary, we have versions of this myth in Old Norse, so Scandinavia, uh, the Roman myth of Romulus and Remus, uh, with the Greek myths, with the Rig Veda within the Vedic, uh, or now Hindu religion, and throughout the Near East cultures in uh, Iran, Persia, and the Mesopotamian region between the Tigris and Euphrates. In the earliest versions of the myths from these cultures, the primordial being is a twin figure, often an androgyny, with a name cognate to Yemo, and then a sacrifice is made to create the world from body parts of the primordial being. Although in some examples a city or empire is built, uh, and we also see in certain evolutionary traits of the myth where it's evolved that the primordial being stops being the one being sacrificed and sometimes the cow is sacrificed in instead. And in a few versions even Manus is sacrificed. But the overall myth remains constant. The plot similarities, the name of the primordial being cognate with Yumo, uh, and the twin figure, a sacrifice of the creature to make the earth, and coupled with known migrations of the Proto Indo European speaking populations through archaeology and DNA evidence, show that these stories 
are related. So now we should have confidence in the Proto-Indo-European myth of creation, how it migrated west to Scandinavia through uh, Germania, offshoots into Greece and Italy. But the other side went eastwards towards the Indo-Iranians, and then the Iranians, Persians, and into Mesopotamia. Uh, and it was picked up by the Sumerians and then the Babylonians. And what we hope to see now is that the writers of the Bible who were living in close proximity to the Babylonians then picked up this story from the Babylonians to help create Genesis, the, the creation story within Genesis. To understand if this could have happened, we need to understand a few things about the region where the Bible was written and where Babylon was in effect, where Jewish religion was created and then we can look at an overview of the biblical creation myth. As whilst most people who haven't read the Bible think that God said let there be light and then created Adam from a handful of earth before creating Eve from Adam, the story of the creation myth in Genesis is actually more detailed and more complex than that. And it's subtle yet critical wording within. And these details need to be understood to really see where the Genesis story originated from. So let's look at a map of the region of the Near East from around what it would look like three and a half thousand years ago. I'll put this up now. You can see how it's shaped politically and culturally. The region of the Near East is also known as the Fertile Crescent due to the freshwater sources enhancing the ability to farm. And I'll highlight the Fertile Crescent in green on the map which go through the Nile in Egypt, through what is now Israel but was referred to as Canaan back then and then it went round and down through the Tigris and Euphrates rivers and the area between these two rivers is known as Mesopotamia. Now if I show Egypt's empire you see that Egypt actually controlled the area that was Canaan around three and a half thousand years ago and this is interesting as it means that the cities considered the birthplace of Judaism were under Egyptian control there may be evidence of the influence of this too within the stories of the Old Testament and Genesis. And to the east we have the area of the rivers of the Tigris and Euphrates, which were once part of the Sumerian Empire before three and a half thousand years ago, and which would eventually become the Babylonian Empire. Within this region, water was important. The rivers were essential for farming and irrigation, but the sea was considered challenging. These cultures were not natural sailors and so there is an underlying concern about the sea and this too could be reflected in stories. Now the story of the Proto-European myth yeah, in this region starts with an archaeological find within the region where a number of tablets that had on them a story. And that story we now know as the Enuma Elish and that means when on high and this story was a creation myth told by the Sumerians and then the Babylonians. And we know their creation myth was influenced by the Proto-Indo-Europeans. And in that video, I will explain the Enuma Elish, read it, uh, and talk about some of the subjects in it. So you may want to watch that first before you can understand what's going on here in real detail. But I'll summarise the Babylonian version of the creation myth of the Enuma Elish here for those who haven't seen the video. But it is a, a real synopsis. And it starts in a cosmos of water, with a male freshwater primordial being of Apsu and a female saltwater primordial being of Tiamat. And Tiamat is often referred to as a dragon. Now, these represent the twin primordial being of creation as they come together in one large form of water. And after an argument, one of Apsu and Tiamat's children kills Apsu. And then another of their descendants, called Marduk, then kills Tiamat by sending magical wind into her mouth, meaning she cannot close it, and then he can fire an arrow down into her stomach and splits her in two. From her body, he makes the world. And from the blood of her ally, Kingu, Marduk then makes man, and what is specifically called a savage man, um, who shall work on earth for the benefit of the gods. And this represents man sacrificing the primordial being to make the world before created man um, and again aligning to the Proto-Indo-European creation myth. And knowing this it will help us as we go through the biblical creation myth. So in summary what we're saying is by looking at a map of the area 
that the book of Genesis, found in the Jewish Torah and the Old Testament, possibly had two major influences, the Babylonians and the Egyptians who controlled the region between them. And so we might expect to see influence from these cultures within the Old Testament, and therefore possibly Genesis. And this is exactly what has happened. There are actually two creation myths within Genesis, known in Hebrew as Aleph and Bet, uh, or versions A and B, Alpha and Beta to us. Now, with the Egyptian story uh, that is labelled A, and is in chapter 2 of Genesis predominantly, and the Babylonian story is B, and is predominantly in chapter 1. And these two stories are, because they're written next to each other, um, it is very clear they deliver a number of contradictions. Um, and so this also confuses those who are unaware if they try to call the plot of creation, as because those two stories, it's quite easy to mix up the different creation myths. Now, knowing there are two stories, it in a way can make it simple to pull out the Babylonian one, as there is this difference. And then we can check if that still contains key myth details recognised from the Babylonian creation myth proper, uh, and then we should not only be able to connect it with the Enuma Elish, but potentially also with the Proto-Indo-European creation myth. And so the only way to prove this is to, in effect, for, take apart the first chapter of Genesis. But before we do that, we have to decide on the version of Genesis to look at, as there are tens of versions of the Bible, uh, there may be even more than that. Um, such as probably the King James Version is the most popular. But what we really want is a reference to a Bible that is not subject to all the modern interpretations and influences. And so I'm going to use the wording of Genesis from the Torah. Uh, and for me, I specifically got that from a version which is from the Jewish uh, Publishing Society's Torah commentary on Genesis. So let's jump into Genesis and see what's going on. And the best place to start is the first sentences of the book. Now, these reveal a huge amount, as most Bibles start with the words, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And we'll stop there, as this isn't true. Uh, well, it's not a true translation. It's actually more accurate if we say, when God began to create heaven and earth. A subtle yet distinct difference suggesting that God already existed and the cosmos already existed and the story is just picking up when God decides to create the heaven and the earth. The word, although the wording is suggesting that this may not have been God's first task. Remember, this is just the start of the story. It is saying what he will be doing in Genesis. The in the beginning part used by the Bibles shouldn't be taken literally. Genesis, Genesis itself, the word, really means that it is the most important story. It is the place where the Bible starts. Um, it's akin to the Enuma Elish and its meaning of when on high. And so people have tended to take that and slap that as the first line of, of the Bible where that isn't appropriate. Now, what we can be sure about is that this is not the, talking about the starting birth of God, the start of the cosmos, or the birth of the primordial beings. So a better way to look at it is that the first sentence of the Bible is saying, this is an important story and the first you should read, and that God already existed in the cosmos when this Bible story begins. And knowing this, I will now read the whole of the first sentence of Genesis using the Hebrew translation, and it says this. When God began to create the heaven and earth, the earth being unformed and void, with darkness over the surface of the deep, and a wind from God sweeping over the water, God said, Let there be light. There was light. So just in this one sentence, representing the first three verses of Genesis, there is so much more going on than many realise. So let's dig into this further. Now, having touched on the first part of the sentence, the second part refers to earth being unformed and void, suggesting there is something there, but not shaped, and not land, not earth, something that needs order, that is, water. So why do we think this? 
Well, firstly, if it's not land, then we can infer it is the opposite of that. And in the ancient world, that would have been considered water. But we can also be assured that this is the case because in the next part of the sentence, it says darkness over the surface of the deep, followed by a wind from God sweeping over the water. The sentence in tennis, the cosmos is water. And so by saying that, uh, the cosmos of the Bible is made of water and it refers to the deep, then we can feel confident that it is aligning directly with the Babylonian creation myths beginning, which starts with water, with Apsu and Tiamat, both of whom names uh, are related with the word deep. But there's more. And when the Hebrew text refers to the deep, the Hebrew for this is Tihom, and this is cognate with the Babylonian Tiam. In effect, they are the same word, but different languages. Um, but then, if you make Tiam feminine, it becomes Tiamat, the name of the female salt water primordial being from the Enuma Elish, the name of the dragon, the name of chaos. So when darkness is over the surface of the deep is red, it is saying darkness is over the surface of Tiamat, the dragon of chaos. And with this understood, then referencing a wind from God sweeping over the water can be accurately made. And the reference to wind does not mean spirit or soul, as it's often translated as the translations that infer that the wind means spirit or soul are based on modern Hebrew context of the word, um, as though God is breathing life into the sea. And that's a, a common sort of analysis of the term wind or metaphor people use. But the reference to wind from God is based on ruach, uh, and its ancient meaning, which, when Genesis was written, meant wind, just wind, not spirit or breath. However, the wind is a power a storm god produces and what Marduk produced to kill Tiamat in the Enuma Elish. So here it can literally mean the wind from God is sweeping over Tiamat, in effect inferring that God is killing Tiamat, killing the chaos of the waters, allowing order in the cosmos. In effect, the first sentence is summarising the Babylonian creation myth, which may seem odd to us, but for people at the time, when hearing the first line, this story um, is being referred to, they would know they were talking about the, the myth and the Enuma Elish, and so they would be immediately engaged. But when the last part of the first sentence was said, then people would have stopped and listened, as when it's quoted as, God said, let there be light, and there was light. This was different to how miracles were usually enacted, not part of the story people were used to hearing at the time. So what was going on? Well, the priests and writers of the time were invoking a story that everyone knew. It has the watery deep, the wind, the dragon of chaos. And then it goes on, let there be light, and there was light. And those who were listening would have gone, eh? You know, where, where's the battle? You know, when are the gods created? What is this? And their attention would have been held, that there would have been some intrigue there. Then the delivery of the miracle of light would have been considered unusual. As whilst Marduk, the Babylonian god, uh, spoke miracles, um, to then observe a miracle and to say it was good was very much aligned to the uh, Egyptian mythology. And this process of delivering the miracle, uh, seen at the end of the very first sentence, when God says, let there be light, and there was light. And then, saying in verse 4, God saw that the light was good. And God separated light from darkness. And so, at the end of the first sentence, the story twists into some Egyptian mythology. And in fact, this continues over a number of verses where God says something, he sees something, and then he approves it. And this way of enacting miracles can be found in the stories of the Egyptian god Ptah, one of the oldest deities in Egyptology, and a creator god. He is said to have existed before all other things, um, and through his will he created all things and realised it through his word. And that approach, that behaviour, sounds similar to the Abrahamic god. 
stories about him say that he created gods of Atom and Shu, Tefnut, Natangeb, Isis, uh, Set and Nephthys, uh, and he's also considered the father of uh, Imhotep, uh, as well as being considered the catalyst to a soul's rebirth, uh, which may also influence stories in the Bible later on. And so, by the time we get to the end of just the first sentence of Genesis, we see clear Mesopotamian and Egyptian influence in the story. We see the Babylonian cosmos of water, the alignment of the myth uh, with the Battle of Marduk and Tiamat, and the leverage of the power and repeating of the enactment of creation that the Egyptian creator god Ptah had. And perhaps a better way to, to say this is if I, I was to write that sentence expanding it, the first sentence of Genesis, expanding it to what we know it would have meant to an audience who understood Babylonian mythology, it probably would have sounded something like this. When God began to create the heaven and earth, the cosmos was made of water, and within that water was Tiamat, the dragon of chaos. God killed the dragon using the seven powerful winds, and from the body parts of the dragon, God would be able to create the world. But first, God commanded light to shine, and light shone, removing all remaining chaos. God was pleased. Now, as we're trying to link this to the Proto-Indo-European creation myth, this shows a common thread of creating order from chaos, principle of these Indo-European religions, and that continued into the Enuma Elish. And, as we can now see, that principle of order from chaos went into the Bible. Understanding all this allows us to ask many other questions, such as, does this alignment with the Enuma Elish and the Babylonian creation myth mean that the god of Genesis is the Babylonian god Marduk, a god with four eyes, and four ears, as though he is two people. Possibly a twin figure in one? Does that sound familiar? Well, I'll leave that answer to another video because that isn't what we're really looking at, is like who is God? Um, that's quite a big question and probably requires an even bigger video. Um, but an important question to ask is why did the writers remove the Enuma Lilish mythology from the story of Genesis if they are inferring it as the start of the story? And this was to position God. In effect, Genesis demythologizes the creation story, removing the story of how gods came to be. The, the, the authors, by doing that, made God the God of Genesis, a supreme being unchallenged with unlimited power. So, this God is an evolution from Marduk. Um, and, and Marduk was a in the atheistic god, a god who is a primary god, but had other gods with him. And instead, the biblical narrative pushes towards a monotheistic god, and that's the god we're aware of in uh, the Abrahamic religions today. And this god of Genesis has this more monotheistic role, because by removing the mythology of the Enuma Elish from the start of the Genesis story, the mythology that was established to create these stories, the mythology that created gods, the heroes, at the beginning of the time, removing these, suppressing these, in effect hiding them, allows the first line, when God began to create heaven and earth, to be written. And for people at the time to understand this, uh, by removing the reference to all the other gods, it removes issues people may have had wanting to believe in the other gods, as they just weren't there anymore to have issue with. But no, I haven't said that God is a monotheistic God, only that there is movement towards that. And I'll explain why in a bit. But first, we must continue with Genesis a bit more. Now, if we carry on with what the Bible says, it says, So God, having created order and calmed the sea, uh, in verse 6 says, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the water, and it may separate water from water. In verse 7, it then says, God made the expanse, which separated the water from below the expanse with water from above the expanse. And here we see water, the cosmos, being split into two, much like salt water and fresh water, and the splitting of the primordial being, the twin, Yemo, into two. And this again shows continuity from the Proto-Indo-European myth. However, 
There seems to be no obvious sacrifice from which the land is made, and this is down to the mythology being suppressed, with the earlier wind over the water hinting at the killing of Tiamat, and therefore it is inferring Tiamat's body being used to make the earth, but it isn't explicitly stated. And the creation of the world actually happens in verses 9 and 10. God gathers water together in this expanse to make the seas, and this makes dry land appear. Again, the mythology of using the body parts of the primordial being is, isn't there. You know, it, it has been suppressed. And we then go through a process of God speaking miracles, observing them, and then saying they were good. So whilst there are elements of physical creation of the world, and it is coupled with the Egyptian mythology of speak a miracle, watch a miracle, and then say it looks good. The suppression has hidden some of the mythology we would expect to be obvious in previous Indo-European type myths. Well, I'll put up a picture of the Earth of Genesis, what it would have looked like in the mind of the writers. In, in fact, it's a bubble in a watery cosmos, just so you understand how the perception of things happened. And so God creates the world over six days and there's a pattern in this creation and whilst it isn't directly part of the research here in linking with the Proto-Indo-European myth, it's an interesting to point out. And so in day one, God creates light and darkness and in day four, he creates heavenly bodies that, that are in or use the lightness and darkness. Day two, he creates the firmament, the sky and the water. In day five, he creates birds and fish that use the sky and water. And on day three, he creates land and vegetation. And on day six, he creates land animals and humans that use them. These pairings show there is some connection and natural correlation. And by looking at the sixth day, it shows that humans should be eating vegetation. There is no conflict uh, or no evil with animals. There are no people eating animals. In effect, man is a vegetarian in Genesis. And that is contradicted later on in the, in the Bible. But I just thought it was an interesting point that early on it looked as though man should only eat vegetation. Now, looking at the creationists from afar, we also see some other contradictions. As often, and is made of vegetation. God then goes on to create the sun and the moon, even though he created light at the very beginning of the book. And again, this is a clashing of two sources of the creation myth coming together uh, and the way light was understood uh, and darkness was understood. It, like Darkness wasn't an absence of light. Darkness was a, a source. So uh, the Bible goes through this creation until verse 24, where God creates every kind of living creature. And the only animal specifically named is cattle, cow-type creatures, uh, potentially referring to the importance of the cow in creation, and certainly the importance of the cow in farming and surviving. Uh, and this, well, I've mentioned uh, previously, is because the cow, to humans, is 100% useful. We use its hide, we use its bones, we eat its meat, we even eat its babies and we drink the baby's food. You can see how the cow was seen as been having been made for man, for, for man to be able to consume and use it all. It was like the perfect animal. And so, understanding all this, we arrive at verse 26 in the Bible where God says, I'm going to make man in our image and likeness, and then saying, they shall rule cattle and other animals. And this is remarkably interesting for a couple of reasons. Firstly, God says our image, our, as in multiple gods, hinting at the Babylonian influence and not yet finalising the monotheistic view. And then when he says man, he then says they shall rule the animals before again mentioning cattle specifically. Here, the act of creating humans is the final act and being created in the image of God makes them more important than the man of the Enuma Elish. And specifically, the fact that humans look like God means that they can be given control over animals and the like, as opposed to being there to do work for the gods, which is the message from the Babylonian myth. In effect, the role of man has been switched. It is opposite. And this may be one of the things that made the religion popular in the region. And applying this thought that humans are the image of God, and it would mean that humans are, in a way, sacred. To kill someone must be punished with the killing of the person who did the killing. And this 
breaks the older mythologies around humans. Here, God cares about the humans rather than the humans being created to care about the gods. But that isn't where our interest ends, as perhaps one of the most interesting things is the name used for man. When God created them, so, and that, that is the word used, them, more than one person, he doesn't specify gender. The name used is called Adam. Not the proper name Adam, but Adam, spelled the same way, but a generic term, which literally means earthling, or what we would now view as human. Now, what is even more interesting is that this Adam is, is not gendered, and because the Adam was created in the image of God, this would infer that God was genderless. But in verse 27, there is some clarity when it states God creates Adam in both male and female. And so this could also be used to infer God was both genders, neither man nor woman, but both representing an androgyny or two people as one, a twin figure. And again, this is a direct link to the Proto-Indo-European creation myth and the primordial being. And with this, so ends chapter one. Genesis. And chapter 2 begins and tells another creation story very different to chapter 1. And this is where man is created from earth and the Garden of Eden is made and man names all the animals and again cattle is specifically mentioned and after this God makes man who he named with the names Adam and then he took his rib to make another human woman and now the rib could also infer that man is split in two. But in either way, the intention is to make woman Eve as she would be known to be equal with Adam. And this process of giving part of the body to create another is a theme in many other myths from Greece to Babylon, where from the forehead to the ear uh, is given to make another human. So with that walkthrough of chapter one of Genesis, we've sort of touched on a few points which I will summarise as the book starts, so, so Genesis here, uh, without mythology of the battle between a god and Tiamat the dragon, which allows the world to be created, but instead starts with the cosmos is water and Tihom. Well, that is how the listeners at the time would have heard it. God uses the wind to calm Tihom, just as the Babylonian myth says Marduk uses wind to help Tiamat, and this would engage the audience into a story they think they know. When the story changes to what was told, God just creates the world, leveraging the Egyptian myth, before creating man and going back to the primordial androgyny of a god who is both man and woman. But man is treated as a being in the image of God and not a slave of a god. And so whilst we see huge hints that the creation of Genesis is based on the Babylonian creation story, and therefore the Proto-Indo-European creation myths at its root, there are further clues to substantiate the link. And because the myth that is the root of the story is so well known, the battle of the god versus the dragon from which order was created, and the world was formed using the body of the dragon, the Battle of Tiamat, or Tihom, as people refer it to here, is within the Old Testament. It is noted. So where is this battle? Are there hints elsewhere in the Old Testament on, on this, this missing battle to prove the evolution of the Babylonian myth? Well, there are. And it exists in a few places. We'll start with Psalm 74, verses 13 to 17, which is talking about what God has achieved. And it says, You divided the sea with your strength, referring to creating a firmament. You shattered the heads of the sea monsters in the waters. You crushed the heads of Leviathan and made him food for the folk living in the wilderness, showing that the killing of Tiamat and Apsu has been noted. It says, You created rivers and streams such that they will never dry up. Yours is the day and also the night. You have established the light and the sun, and you have set all the borders of the earth, and you have made the summer and winter. And here, again referring to the creation of the world from killing the dragon, Tihom, and showing that things are now order and chaos. Although the psalm does refer to the monster as a hymn, uh, rather than a her, which is unusual, but referencing the word deep is a male word. 
And this is a little odd as chaos and dragons in mythology are often represented as female in form across the world. It is an inherent concept of man to think of these forms as being female. Not only Tiamat, who, who was a woman, uh, but Medusa or uh, Echidna, uh, both half snake, half woman, or the harpies, half bird, half woman, or the sirens, the mermaid esque creatures. Or on the other side of the world, there's a Quetzalcoatl of the Aztecs, all female. But if you're not convinced with Psalms, then there's Isaiah 51. Verses 9 and 10. And again, that refers to the mythology that Genesis has suppressed. When he says about God, Was it not you who cut Rahab to pieces, who pierced that monster through? Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, who made a road in the depths of the sea so that the redeemed might cross over? Here, Rahab comes from the Hebrew word Rahab which means storm or arrogance, and was used to symbolise Egypt uh, and its propensity to enslave Israelis or Israelites, and refers to the term as a monster, again, inferring that suppressed battle from the Babylonian myth. But to me, in our quest to find links to the Proto-Indo-European, it is Job 40, verses 15 to 24, and then Job 41, or Job 40, verses 25 onwards, depending on the translation of the Bible you're using. Uh, and it is this that provides the best clue hidden in plain sight. This passage has had a much debate about it and, and what it really means. But to me, I support ideas that are similar to scholars such as uh, Gunkel and uh, Zimmern as identifying the monsters in these passages as Tiamat and Kingu, and not whales or elephants as often suggested by some translations. And I'll read some of the verses of Job chapter 40 from verse 15 onwards. And these go, Look at Behemoth, which I made along with you, and which feeds on a grass like an ox. What strength it has in its loins, what power in the muscles of its belly. Its tail sways like a cedar, and sinews of its thighs are close-knit. Hidden here, within plain sight, is a huge clue as to who these monsters really were. It is hinted at subtly around the description of the belly and the tail. But the very first line, Look at Behemoth, which I made along with you, and which feeds on grass like an ox. It could be saying, look at this monster, it feeds on grass like an ox. But if you put the pieces together, I actually see this reflecting the fact that was also hidden in the Enuma Elish until a newer version of Tablet 5 was found. A tablet that refers to Tiamat's udders and other physical features that were cow-like. And so here it reinforces that Tiamat is in fact in some form a cow. The cow sacrificed by somebody in the European creation myths to create the world. If we look at Job 41, or Job 40, verse 25 onwards, we see God is, in effect, flexing, uh, saying how he beat Leviathan. And again, with the context of Job 40, this is referring to the battle that was in the Enuma Elish and the demythologized Genesis. The first line goes, Can you pull in Leviathan with a fish hook, or tie down its tongue with a rope? Can you put a cord through its nose or pierce its jaw with a hook? Will it keep begging you for mercy? So, in Job 40 and 41, God could well be reflecting on his battle with Tiamat and Kingu, and not only providing links to the connections of the mythology of the Enuma Elish, the Babylonian creation myth, but direct links further back. There was a purpose behind the first book of Genesis, in demythologizing Genesis, and that is to show the new God is uncontested and powerful, and can create with just his word. The world he creates is still a bubble in water. The firmament is pushed up against the water above, and that equates with the meaning of the Hebrew word to be pushed up, firmament. And the ground pushes down on the water below. And this not only aligns with the innumerable leash, but also allows God to flood the world easily by opening up holes in the firmament when he's angry for 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, the story of the flood where God decides to 
get a man to place two of all the world's animals on a boat that would have been smaller than the Titanic and then drown all the men, women and children of the world who weren't in Noah's tribe. He's such a great and powerful god. But the myth of the Enuma Elish was powerful. It had been told for hundreds of years and was so ingrained in the culture that whilst it was tried to be lost in the Old Testament, it couldn't be completely written out. It couldn't be completely written out of Genesis as no one would listen to the story or recognise it without those hints there. I could go on now and talk about the Garden of Eden and the difference between the Tree of Life and the Tree of Knowledge. Why the quest for knowledge was put in over the quest for immortality. You know, how the apple wasn't an apple. How Eve didn't tempt Adam. But those stories can wait for another video if you want me to talk about those things. But for now, the proto-Indo-European creation myth with its primordial twin, the cow whose resources feed the world, a sacrifice to enable the creation of the world, the making of man. These things endured the myths and its journey throughout the Indo-Iranian, the Sumerian, Babylonian cultures. And now we can see that it is turned up in the Jewish and consequently all the Abrahamic religions. Their creation myth is based on a battle between twin monsters in a cosmos of water, with the main monster of chaos representing the cow, which was sacrificed. But if that doesn't suggest to you that the Proto-Indo-European myth influenced the Jewish religion, then there are other pieces of information, such as the discovery of Zoroastrian images in ancient Jewish synagogues, or old Christian poems in Russia that hint at the Proto-Indo-European creation myth. And I'll talk about these in future videos, I'm sure. But for now, we come to the end of our journey, showing that Genesis is just a rehash of an ancient myth. And I hope you see how that creation myth of ancestors, which started probably 8,000 years ago, spread to the Near East, and has endured over thousands of years as it's evolved, never losing its key concepts. The consequence is that the Abrahamic religions have in their roots the Proto-Indo-European religion, the same religion that spawned other religions across Eurasia, from the Vikings to the Greeks to the Hindus. And with that, I want to say I hope you enjoyed this video. You found some of the things interesting and some points you may not have known. Uh, and let me say thank you to watching this video as well. Now, all my videos, this has been a really enjoyable YouTube journey to make with you. And if you enjoyed, then please click like, share this, subscribe to the channel. It means a lot and it means others get to see the video too. So please stay safe and stay well. This is Craig and Ford.